by Judy Untitled. Following the upheavals in Henan and the famine in Guangnei district, my brothers were scattered, each in a different place. At full moon, I was moved to express my thoughts and send this to my elder brother in Fuliang, my seventh brother in Yuqian, my fifteenth brother in Niaojiang, also to be shown to my younger brothers and sisters in Fuli and Xiagui. In this disastrous year of famine, we lost everything. My brothers, all exiled, scattered east and west. The country, devastated in the aftermath of war. Flesh and blood forced out to roam the streets. I mourn my shadow lost to the wandering wild goose. Fragile plants are blown away, torn from their roots. We each look at the same moon through flowing tears. One night, five, pace, five places, the same sickness in our hearts. So we continue with poems by Bai Juji. Now Bai Juji, as we've already encountered some of his poems, he has a, a total of uh, six, I believe, in the collection, which is pretty much uh, a, uh, an underrepresentation of, of, of what he probably should have had. He was a very prolific writer. A lot of his poems have been preserved till today. I think he's probably the best uh, preserved Tang poet extremely popular out of China itself, very popular in Japan. And uh, he was quite important as well, probably the most important mid-tang poet. So, you know, just six poems seems like a bit of a, an understatement. Anyway, Bai Juji, mid-tang poet, basically lives in... Well, he had a very long life, actually. Uh, I think he lived until his 70s or, or so. But uh, uh, most of his productive life... Uh, took place in the mid-Tang era, especially the period 800-820. Uh, now, uh, this poem of his, uh, well, first of all, it says untitled, uh, um, and it has a big prologue. Other, other versions have, have, trans have considered this very long prologue as the title of the poem. And uh, we were saying he has six poems in the anthology. This is the fourth. And probably this is more representative of the style of the usual type of Bai Yuji's poems. Because he has such a big and well-preserved production, you have Bai Yuji poems in all types of modes and styles and tones. But probably what was more quintessential or close to his heart, to his political and ideological intentions, is a poem like this. You know, he was famous, along with his friend Yuan Chen, whose poems we've been reading of late, for the, mm, the, 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 the new Jue Fu uh, he, he tried to give a new lease of life to that old ballad style poetry by um, making it a, a more strongly Confucian genre of uh, social criticism. And during the very troubling times of the mid Tang, he had lots of material to criticize about. So, going specifically to, 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 to this poem, uh, we know that the date of composition, because of the events it talks about, is about 799 800. At this time, uh, the emperor was still Emperor uh, Tetsong, I believe. These were probably the last years of Emperor Tetsong. And this was a period of a considerable upheaval. So since the al Mushan rebellion, almost uh, 40 years or so had passed, but the military governors were still fairly entrenched in the east and the, the emperor's powers had been greatly curtailed in practice. Uh, during the reigns of, of emperors uh, Dezong and Daizong, some attempts at restoration were made, uh, but, but these wouldn't really flourish until the reign of the next emperor, uh, Xianzong, the, the emperor of the Yuanghe era, which is the, the high tide of the mid-Tang period and of the restoration of Tang power. So the events that form the background to this poem are basically the rebellion of Wu Xiaocheng. Wu Xiaocheng was one of the Ye Dushi, one of the military governors, uh, headquartered in uh, the Changji district, which was in the, in the area of modern-day Zhumadian in southern Henan. 
uh, close to the River Huai, so between the River Huai and, uh, and, 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 the, and the Yellow River. So in about, um, I think it was, it was 798 or so, he started a rebellion, he started pillaging nearby prefectures. Uh, the government uh, ordered the other military governors surrounding Wu Xiaocheng to defeat him, and there was a series of military campaigns conducted there, but they were completely unsuccessful. So uh, after a couple of years or so, in 800, Emperor Dezong had to, uh, after repeated failure of military campaigns, he had to reach a sort of an agreement, letting letting this military, this rebellious military governor, off the hook. Now, this rebellion, as we say, the, the territory of Wu Xiaocheng, Shangxi district, was located in the southern area of Henan, and it was in an appropriate area to interrupt the flow of goods and, uh, and especially provisions coming from South China to North China. So since the construction of the Grand Canal and uh, with the progressive desertification of the territory in the west of China, where the capital uh, Chang'an was, the lifeline of, of, of the capital, especially as regarding food, depended on massive shipments of grain and on granaries stationed at different intervals. Uh, these uh, grain-carrying ships would go up from the, 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 uh, the, uh, the Jiangsu River Valley. They would follow the Grand Canal up until it merged with uh, the Yellow River and then all the way west uh, until reaching the, the, the Wei River Valley and the capital, Chang'an itself. So any massive rebellion in any part of the, of the itinerary would cut down uh, the, sh the grain shipments to the capital and would be therefore disastrous. That is what is hinted at in the prologue here. So there were upheavals in Henan, basically this rebellion of the military governor of Changi Circuit. And as a, an immediate consequence, with no grain shipments arriving at the capital and perhaps some droughts or other problems, the capital area, Wangnei, the land within the passes, uh, was subjected to starvation and famine. So a very serious crisis, but again, this was a period of crisis after crisis after crisis. Uh, so after this historical reference, the prologue by Bai Yuji clearly puts the focus on the personal grief that this has caused. So he has a very extensive family from what we can see from the prologue, lots of brothers, and they're all separated. Some of them are in office. In fact, uh, um, Bai Juyi himself was probably in one of his first postings. He passed uh, the, um, the Jinshi examinations in 800, so this would have been just before that. I think he was posted in a yeah, minor place in Suzhou at the time, so pretty far from the capital, but not that far from the scenario of battle and fight. Uh, okay, so having given the background to this poem, let's talk a little bit about its topic. It's a pretty conventional one. This feels a bit like the typical Du Fu poems that we've encountered because of its merging of personal grief with national grief. Although the catastrophe here is not, in spite of what we might be led to believe by the tone and the development of the poem itself, it's not such a major event. This was pretty easily solved, I believe. And, you know, in the next reign, uh, this, uh, this rebellious leader would finally be brought to heel. So this is not the Anushan Rebellion, but still we get the same type of poem that we read as in when, uh, as in when, uh, uh, you know, we read about Du Fu leaving the capital in the hands of the rebels and desperate to communicate with family members, with relatives from whom he was cut off. Cut off. So this is the same type of poem. Uh, there's national grief, there's famine, there's warfare, and... To make matters worse, Bai Yuji is separated from his uh, friends, or rather his family, his brothers, but he would have had a close relationship with them. So the poem basically describes the devastation, describes the private grief, and it feels like a pretty conventional poem describing, you know, the, the horrors of war and famine, yeah, and making it slightly personal by adding that extra layer of separation from from brothers, from family, uprootedness. And uh, there's a pretty conventional image as well of the moon, and we've, we've talked about this in many poems, this is an idea that appears in a lot of poems mm, of lovers, of uh, being under the same moon and looking longingly to the heavenly body while being thousands or, or tens of thousands of miles apart. So those would be the major topics of the poem. Let's go, as usual, uh, 
couplet by couplet. <clears throat> In this disastrous year of famine, we lost everything. My brothers, all exiled, scattered east and west. So the first couplet clearly starts, you know, by setting the background. This is a disastrous year. But it very quickly hinges on the family aspects of the disaster, more than on the national aspects of the disaster, which will be described with more detail in the next couplet. So... So the first line puts the emphasis on loss. Loss has, uh, has taken place in this disastrous year. It's loss related to famine, and it's loss related to the dispersal of the family nucleus. Uh, brothers are east and west everywhere. Remember, family is very important in traditional Chinese society, and uh, in Confucian values, you know, family, being with the family, having the family united in the family seat is, you know, crucially important. Second couplet, the country devastated in the aftermath of war. Flesh and blood forced out to roam the streets. So the second couplet, uh, generally in, in a poem like this, the progression goes from the more, um, from the more abstract or generic, or, or from the more open lens focus to more specific details and subjective uh, impressions. But here, the first couplet talked about the famine and separation from family. The second couplet connects us with the upheavals, which seem to have just finished the military um, battles that have been taking place relatively close to Baijuji. So the country is devastated by war and famine. And uh, the fourth line is a bit complicated. I don't quite get it. Flesh and blood forced out to roam the streets. Yes, the country devastated in the aftermath of war. Flesh and blood forced out to roam the streets. Um, another translation of this line, my own flesh and blood becomes scum of the street. So, so this is a complicated line. I don't quite get what, what, what it seems to be pointing at. So is it that the streets are, blow, are flowing with um, flesh and blood? You know, the victims, the, the dead or the mutilated from uh, warfare, you know? Or does it seem, is it, is it relating that, that Baijuji's own flesh and blood is flowing on the street? Uh, it's, it's a bit ambiguous. I, I don't quite get this image. Yeah? Well, one way of interpreting would be that the flesh and blood are roaming the streets as if they were beggars. Yeah. Mm, again, which uh, or whose flesh and blood... Mm, Definitely, if, if, it, if, it, if it means by Jujis, it would be a bit of a hyperbolic statement. But anyway, we get this image. This is a time of warfare, strife, hunger. The dead and, you know, the, 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 the mutilated or dead bodies, whether it be from famine, from illness, from war, you know, ravage the streets like beggars used to do in better times. Third couplet. I mourn my shadow lost to the wandering wild goose. Fragile plants are blown away, torn from their roots. So this couplet is easier to, to follow and e easier to interpret. We get two very conventional images of uprootedness that appear over and over and over again in scholar official poems. The scholar official sees a geese, sees the geese or one specific migrating goose, and he feels identified with it. You know, the goose, the traveling bird, associated also with the sad season of autumn usually, you know, indicates the uprooted scholar official who feels alone, uh, who is far away from friends and family. And the other image, the fragile plants being blown away, you know, is also an autumn image, I believe. And uh, again, it, the image of the plant without its roots, you know, hammers in the point of the severing of family ties and how traumatic this feels for the scholar official and for the Confucian uh, with strong family values. Finally, the conclusion ends with a pathetic note with the, the, the conventional image I mentioned earlier of gazing at the moon while being in different places and longing for each other. So it ends on a rather personal note for all of these conflicts, but it makes sense because, as, as we've said, the personal is intertwined with the political very closely all through this poem. We each look at the same moon through flowing tears. One night, 
five places. The same sickness in our hearts. Not a bad poem. Um, to my taste, this is a bit or two, a little bit too conventional. It's a tad predictable. You know, the images are the typical images of separation. But then again, the poem is inspired on real facts and on real family separation. So I wouldn't... I wouldn't go so far as to call it insincere, but, uh, you know, feels like a pretty conventional picture of the disorders uh, caused by war and famine that, uh, and that, that, you know, preyed so much upon the Chinese population in the aftermath of the Anglo-Shan Rebellion. Here in the long aftermath, because, as I said, this poem takes place almost half a century after the rebellion, but uh, its effects and especially its consequences were still, were still being felt and suffered by the population.